if you're an extraordinarily compassionate person, let's say, 98th percentile will say, you're going to be sacrificing yourself to other people all the time. And there are people who will find that extraordinarily endearing. And it will be under some circumstances, but the problem is, is that you will sacrifice yourself. And so, you will get taken advantage of continually by people who are looking for someone like you until you grow some teeth. And you'll think, no, no, that's the opposite of compassion. Being able to bite hard is the opposite of compassion, which it is. And so you'll have that pushed into the predator category. I'm not doing that. I'm not getting angry. I don't like conflict. It's like until you bring that out of the depths and put it on so you can use it, you're going to be in trouble. And that's kind of Nietzsche's idea of the revaluation of good and evil, right? You have a sense of what's good and a sense of what isn't with your conscience, but it's not very smart. It's got things in the wrong boxes. And a lot of the things that even nature itself, a lot of the things that you accept as untrammeled goods, like compassion, let's say, have a very dark side, first of all, and second, are not enough to get you through life. You need the opposite virtues, too. And so you have to develop them. The persona, you could say, is a good way of thinking about it. You know, you watch all those rom-coms where there's always kind of a beta male guy who's being real friendly and always failing miserably with the women because basically he's lying to himself and to them. Um, he's a persona. And a persona is the face that you show to the world when you're trying to uh, pretend and to convince yourself and others that you're, I would say harmless, but we could say a good person. But a good person isn't harmless. A good person is capable of Well, maybe a good person is capable of anything, but is willing to hold that in abeyance. I read this interesting commentary a little while ago on a statement by Christ in the New Testament. And the statement generally interpreted is that the meek shall inherit the earth. But I was looking up the multiple translations of the word meek. And meek is actually derived from a Greek word, of course, um, because the Bible, at least some of the original forms of the Bible were in Greek. Um, and that word didn't exactly mean meek. It meant something like uh, those who have weapons and the ability to use them but determined to keep them sheathed will inherit the world. And that means that people who are capable of force, let's say, but decide not to use it are in the proper moral position. And Nietzsche commented on that a fair bit too, you know. he. He um, thought of most moral morality as cowardice, not because morality itself was cowardice, but because most people who are cowards disguise their coward cowardice as morality. And they claim that their harmlessness, which is actually a consequence of their fear and inability to be dangerous, is actually a sign of their moral integrity. And that's a really bad idea. So, you know, if you're an axe murderer, but you don't have an axe, that doesn't mean that you're moral. So that's the persona. And the persona is the mask that you wear. And that's what persona means, is the mask that you wear to convince yourself and the world that you're not a terrible monster. So that when you look at yourself in the mirror, you don't have to run away screaming. Now, the shadow would be all the parts of the personality that the persona rejects. And that might be the aggressive elements. Certainly, the case, that's the case with, for people who are hyper agreeable. And now you can tell, I think one of the best, there's two pathways to the development of the shadow and they're tightly allied with one another. Um, the fundamental pathway is truth and that's to face the bitter truth about yourself. But to break that down more particularly, you might think about that as the capacity to observe your own resentment. You're going to be resentful and bitter in many situations because you don't get what you want. And if you watch that resentment and bitterness, you'll see that it produces fantasies that can be unbelievably dark. And that can be very frightening. And you might not want to admit to yourself that you're actually capable of having fantasies like that or impulses of, like that or aggressive feelings like that. But the thing is, is that if those aggressive feelings and impulses and fantasies are integrated into your character, it's like you're opening up a dialogue with a part of yourself that can be very forceful and strong and dangerous. And it's really useful to be dangerous because if you can if you can be dangerous you often don't have to be and so 
Anyways, you attend to your resentment honestly and you observe yourself and what you're actually like. You've got to pay attention as if you don't know yourself, as if you might harbor hidden devils and then maybe they'll emerge. Now, Jung also felt that sort of embedded inside the shadow were the contrasexual tendencies. And so, for example, sometimes you see people who are well-developed men, let's say, and we can, we can also talk about women in this regard. Men who've integrated their shadow often also develop a kind of peculiar grace that would be a consequence of not only allowing their aggressive side to step forward, but also their, their feminine and compassionate side that, might, that they may have kept squelched because of embarrassment about it or because they'd been harassed for being weak or any number of things. So, but the practical approach for developing your shadow, I would say, is to co contemplate and consider your resentment and notice what it says. Because your resentment will also tell you what you have to say. I am way too agreeable. What steps can I take to integrate my shadow and stop being a doormat? You're way too agreeable. Well, I would say you you could practice saying what you really believe, that you can take a vow to tell the truth. And that will make you much less agreeable. Uh, agreeable people are perfectly willing to sacrifice what they know to be the case to maintain short-term social harmony. And it's not so much that they repress what they think, it's often that they don't even allow themselves to fully realize what they think. So a uh, commitment to the truth can make an agreeable person, will stop an agreeable person from being a doormat. I mean, if you're in a relationship and the person is irritating you with something they've done, you might be highly motivated not to say anything about it because you want to keep the peace. You don't want to upset them. You don't want the conflict. That's all characteristic of, characteristic of high agreeableness. But once you decide to tell the truth, then if you're annoyed, you don't get to hide it. You don't get to assume you're right. You don't get to grab the person by the shirt collar and say, look, I'm annoyed and you're wrong. You get to say, uh, I've, I'm irritated about this situation and I need to think through that irritation to find out if I have a problem or if you have a problem, but there's, or if we both have a problem or if it's a different problem altogether. But you can't hide the fact that the problem has made itself manifest. And so if you're agreeable and you tell the truth about your emotional state, that will propel you out of that agreeableness by necessity. And so, you know, if you're feeling oppressed at work or you're oppressed in your life or, or you know, or you're oppressing yourself, then you got to notice that you're feeling oppressed. Then you have to notice that you're feeling resentful, re resentful and, and, and angry and bitter and maybe even like Cain in the story of Cain and Abel because Cain is sort of the archetypal bitter man. And then you have to decide what it is that you need to do in order to remove from yourself that bitterness.